Greetings and welcome to the Bible Paladin as we continue our study through the book of Genesis and peel through the layers of meaning. We'll be looking at another difficult and rather adult subject today as we hear about the of Jacob's daughter Dinah and the subsequent reaction of her family. In order to understand and appreciate the significance of some of the details of the story, it's important to once again look at how Jacob and his family arrived at this place. In the last chapter, they end up settling right outside the city of Shechem, which seemed to have been named after the son of the ruler of the city. Now Shechem is a significant city and will feature prominently in many stories going forward. To begin with, this is where God first appeared to Abraham when he entered Canaan and promised him that the land would belong to his descendants. However, we're also told even then that it was occupied by the Canaanites. And we will talk about them more later, but they represented that which was opposed to God and to the faith of Abraham. Jacob only settles here because he is distrustful of his brother, and he does not want to reside near him. Like Lot, he opts to settle in a place that poses a greater threat to him and his family through their idolatrous and immoral culture that would influence his people. And this is exactly what is happening as we begin our narrative with Dinah, the daughter of Jacob and Leah. And she would have been a young teenager at the time. And we start the story with her going into the city to visit some friends. And so we pray to the Lord for wisdom as we read the sacred text. Dinah, the daughter whom Leah had borne to Jacob, went out to visit some of the women of the land. When Shechem, son of Hamor the Hivite, who was chief of the region, saw her, he seized her and lay with her by force. Since he was strongly attracted to Dinah, daughter of Jacob, indeed was really in love with the girl, he endeavored to win her affection. Shechem also asked his father, Hamor, get me this girl for a wife. Meanwhile, Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter Dinah, but since his sons were out in the fields with his livestock, he held his peace until they came home. Now Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to discuss the matter with Jacob, just as Jacob's sons were coming in from the fields. When they heard the news, the men were shocked and seethed with indignation. What Shechem had done was an outrage in Israel. Such a thing could not be tolerated. Hamor appealed to them, saying, My son Shechem has his heart set on your daughter. Please give her to him in marriage. Intermarry with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. Thus you can live among us. The land is open before you. You can settle and move about freely in it and acquire landed property here. Then Shechem, too, appealed to Dinah's father and brothers. Do me this favor, and I will pay whatever you demand of me. No matter how high you set the bridal price, I will pay you whatever you ask. Only give me the maiden in marriage. The story begins with an excursion into town, when Dinah is taken by force by none other than the prince of the town, Shechem himself. And now, although immediately afterward, Shechem declares his love for her, and this is repeated a few times later in the story, make no mistake, the text makes it clear that this was a case of rape. And also it is worth noting that we never get to hear from Dinah in this story. Jacob learns of this pretty quickly as Shechem's father Hamor approaches him for damage control based on his son's crime. Anticipating the reaction of his sons, Jacob remains quiet at first, waiting for them to come in from the fields before telling them the news. Most likely, it would have been Dinah's full brothers who came to this meeting to discuss how to handle the situation, and although Jacob would have full authority to make a decision regarding his daughter, he allows his sons to handle this negotiation. Later, Israelite law would have more guidance on such a situation, but this occurred long before they received the law from God through Moses. If Shechem had approached Jacob before acting, he may have been able to request her hand in marriage, but as it stands, some kind of punishment or a significant payment would be demanded. Dinah's brothers immediately and understandably speak out against this outrage against Israel. And here's the first time that we use Jacob's new name being used to speak about their tribe. Hamor and Shechem try to downplay this assault and ask for Dinah's hand in marriage, saying that they will pay whatever price that they deem fair. So let us see what Dinah's brothers have to say in response to this as we continue. Jacob's sons replied to Shechem and his father Hamor with guile, speaking as they did because their sister Dinah had been defiled. We could not do such a thing, they said, as to give our sister to an uncircumcised man. That would be a disgrace for us. We will agree with you only on this condition, that you become like us by having every male among you circumcised. Then we will give you our daughters and take yours in marriage. 
We will settle among you and become one kindred people with you. But if you do not comply with our terms regarding circumcision, we will take our daughter and go away. Their proposal seemed fair to Hamor and his son Shechem. The young man lost no time in acting in this matter, since he was deeply in love with Jacob's daughter. Moreover, he was more highly respected than anyone else in his clan. So Hamor and his son Shechem went to their town council and thus presented the matter to their fellow townsmen. These men are friendly toward us. Let them settle in the land and move about in it freely. There is ample room in the country for them. We can marry their daughters and give our daughters to them in marriage. But the men will agree to live with us and form one kindred people with us only on this condition, that every male among us be circumcised as they themselves are. Would not the livestock they have acquired, all their animals, then be ours? Let us, therefore, give in to them, so that they may settle among us. All the able-bodied men of the town agreed with Hamor and his son Shechem, and all the males, including every able-bodied man in the community, were circumcised. Just in case you thought that Jacob's sons were being generous in their proposal, the author gives us a hint by saying that they responded with guile which is a word that gives the impression of deceit and cunning. We're also told that they said this because their sister Dinah had been defiled. And that even though Jacob may have turned away from his trickster ways, I'm sure his sons learned a thing or two from him. And so they're able to make this proposal, which Jacob, while he remains silent, is probably aware that they are up to something. And the proposal is, of course, that all of the men of the town be circumcised so that they can join together as one people. Now, Shechem and Hamor reason that if they do come together as one people, they will be able to share in all of the wealth that Jacob and his family have. And this is the angle that they bring to their counsel. Now, of course, Jacob would not condone this course of action. For remember how important it was for him to marry within his own family and also for his father to do so. And so certainly he would not want his sons and daughters to marry within these Canaanite people. And so what happens afterwards? On the third day, while they were still in pain, Dinah's full brothers, Simeon and Levi, two of Jacob's sons, took their swords, advanced against the city without any trouble, and massacred all the males. After they had put Hamor and his son Shechem to the sword, they took Dinah from Shechem's house and left. Then the other sons of Jacob followed up the slaughter and sacked the city in reprisal for their sister Dinah's defilement. They seized their flocks, herds, and asses, whatever was in the city, and in the country around. They carried off all their wealth, their women, and their children, and took for loot whatever was in the houses. Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble upon me by making me loathsome to the inhabitants of this land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. I have so few men that if these people unite against me and attack me, I and my family will be wiped out. But they retorted, should our sister have been treated like a harlot? With all the men of the city agreeing to be circumcised, this leaves them vulnerable, with the pain and often the infections and fever that would have been high on the third day. And so Simeon and Levi go in first and kill all the men, afterwards leaving the city open to be sacked by all of their brothers. In their minds, this was revenge for the wrongdoing that was done to their sister. They punished those who had committed this crime, and they were able to free themselves from the corruption and the bad influence of their neighbors, the Canaanites. Of course, Jacob is not pleased with what happened. And so he finally speaks up after the fact. But even when he does speak up, he seems more concerned that their attack will make them a target in Canaan. His silence not only regarding the rape of his daughter, but also the murderous rampage of his sons has been the source of much discussion. So what are the theological and practical implications of this tale? And while I believe that there are certainly many layers to this passage, I think it is important to first address this on a very human level. And since the story begins with the rape, I think that's a good place to start. I found an article written by Francis Klopper of the University of South Africa, which looks at the story from the view of the victim and explores the harm that many interpretations have caused over the years when her plight is diminished. She quotes a passage from Athalia Brenner's book, I Am, Biblical Women Tell Their Own Stories. I'll have links to these in the description. In the voice of Dinah, she writes, I was about 12 years old, an innocent young girl, who went out to meet the girls of the neighborhood when I saw him, Shechem. We made eye contact, and a cautious mutual attraction was acknowledged. So we talked, 
and he invited me to his home, and I went there, unsuspecting. I was so innocent. I was feeling safe. For in our culture, hospitality to strangers was a sacred duty. Not for them, not for him, for he raped me. I did not consent. Do not believe the interpreters who try to deny it. It was a date rape. It happened in a situation of trust. The fact that my rapist decided to fall for me after the event and to ask my father for my hand in marriage does not diminish his guilt. It can be worse, to be sure, for a deflowered girl, raped or not, is damaged goods. Common opinion was that it was better for me to marry the assailant. But it was impossible for me to love him. On the contrary, I came to hate him with the fervor of a victim. That is what happened to me that day. I suffered greatly, but nobody voiced my suffering. Hammer kept me in his house. I stayed there, silent, in a state of shock. To conclude then, I am Dinah. Raped by Shechem as well as by the ongoing interpretations of my story, doubting the rape and making it appear as only a metaphor for political relations. Unfortunately, her story is far from uncommon, and is the experience of many women even today. And also, like Dinah, they too suffer silently. And perhaps Jacob's silence about the situation echoes that of his daughter Dinah. Throughout history to today, victims of such an assault are often silent for a variety of reasons. Fear mostly, but feelings of guilt and shame, not wanting to relive the pain, living in voiceless suffering, or even actively or forcibly silenced by family, authorities, or even spiritual leaders. When we think about such a violation, we might be able to understand the reaction of her brothers, but even then, this would not take away the pain that she endured or would continue to suffer. I don't know who needs to hear this, but perhaps the silence of Dinah can be a loud cry to the countless victims of abuse. And I pray that you find consolation and perhaps the courage to talk to someone so that you can begin or continue your journey of healing. I've also included some links below for anyone who may need to use them. As a family story, we see the protective nature of the sons of Jacob and their need to avenge their sister. But we also need to realize that they were not justified in their actions, nor does the text suggest that they were. As a patriarch, Jacob's condemnation of their actions speaks volumes. Years later, when Jacob bestows blessings on his children in chapter 49, Simeon and Levi, those who first entered the town to kill the men, he does not bless, but curses them for their actions. Perhaps if they had only killed Shechem for his crime, or demanded some other remuneration, that may have been considered justice for the crime. Remember, the law from Deuteronomy had not yet been given. However, killing all the men and raiding the city would certainly be considered overkill and an act of vengeance. When the laws are finally given, they may seem strict by our standards, but a mandate such as an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, found in Exodus, was there to restrict the payback, as if to say, if one knocks out your tooth, you knock out his tooth, you don't beat him to death. As we look at this account from another perspective, without diminishing the plight of Dinah, we can see another theological understanding of the relationship between the children of Abraham and that of the Canaanites. And as it was said before, this tribe who would be called Israel sees themselves as set apart by God. And this relationship and this understanding of this designation will be further explored in Exodus and the remainder of the Pentateuch. And the enemies, they represent that which is against God. And we will often hear about their idolatry, wickedness, and sexual impropriety. The assault on Dinah brings us all together. And as her brothers state, such a thing is not done in Israel. And let's be honest, wars have been waged for far less. The attack on Shechem, both the man and the city, is the first battle in the war against the people and therefore the culture of the Canaanites. To put it allegorically, it is a spiritual war against that which will turn you away from God. So where does this leave us today? On one level, it serves as a warning and a condemnation of such violent acts. And due to the treatment of women in the ancient world, we might be surprised that the Old Testament even makes such a judgment on the behavior of Shechem. And yet it is clear that it is seen as a violation of Dinah and of her entire family. And the same holds true today. The violence and disrespect that occurs in our communities affects everyone in the community. And it is our responsibility to speak out against such behavior and crimes. Of course, we also are challenged to act with justice and not in the manner in which Simeon and Levi retaliated. This too was not only an act of violence, but they did so by corrupting their own understanding of the sacred covenant, using it to deceive the people of Shechem. 
To use our faith or religious rituals as weapons is certainly an offense against God. The other, more symbolic elements in the narrative can speak to us as well. Just as we heard in the story of Lot and his daughters in the city of Sodom, we too are responsible for the influences that we open up our family to. This of course doesn't mean that they need to live in a bubble, but we should be there to guide them and make them aware of the moral dangers that exist in our society, especially for those of us with young children. What are they watching on television and YouTube? What games are they playing? What are they hearing from friends at school? We can't shield them from everything, but we can talk to them and make them aware of what is good and bad. We can teach them to think critically and also to discern with wisdom. We do this by our presence, our example, and by sharing stories of virtue from our own families as well as from our faith traditions. And with that, I wish you blessings on your journey and with all the challenges that you encounter in life. Thank you so much for joining me. and I look forward to next time when we will be hearing about the death of Isaac and continue our walk with Jacob's family. Until then, speak out against injustice and do good.